Good evening, and um, my name is David Levine. I'm co-chair of Science Writers in New York. I want to thank Joe Bonner, who's behind this. I can't see him, but he's here running this. Mike, we're going to do a show about comedy in the age of COVID. And I have two comedians who are actually science comedians. I've met them both, and I've seen them both perform. My The first um, person would be Brian Mallow. And uh, present, present. Thank you. Appreciate it. Gold Thanks star for having me. In addition to performing and giving science commu communications talks for National Science Foundation, AAAS, NASA, Johns Hopkins, Lawrence Berkeley, and Los Alamos, you produce science videos for Time Magazine and audio pieces for Neil deGrasse Tyson's Star Trek Radio. He works every year with the Lindau Nobel Laureate meetings in Germany, which is where I met you. Producing interviews with Nobel laureates and young scientists. We met in Germany. How romantic. Yeah. Brian has blogged for science. <laughs> Two Jews Communications. meet in Germany at a meeting of Nobel laureates. He worked in science communications at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. He also appeared at TEDx Berkeley, USA Science and Engineering, Engineering Festival, and the Starmus Festival. And the Starmus Festival was in Zurich. And that's where you met Brian May from Queen as well as other astronauts. And stuff. Well, yeah, he was already following me on Instagram, but but we did meet there in person. I was there, but it was 95 degrees, so I didn't stay that long. Yeah, it was very hot. That's how hot it was inside. It was crazy. It was that hot outside, too. Um, Kasha Patel is um, fills the unknown demand of Indian female comics from West Virginia. She is based in Washington. She's a stand up comedian and writer who focuses her jokes on her life as an Indian American in science. She's founder of the comedy production company, DC Science Comedy. She was listed on Thrillist Magazine's Best Undiscovered Comedians in the US, where she was called a unicorn for her uniqueness. She presented a TEDx talk called Sneaking Science into Standup. She has been also featured in the Washington Post, BBC World News, and the Travel Channel's Mysteries at the Museum. Now you have a day job, you work for NASA, right? So. Yep, I'm a science writer at NASA, nine to five, and then a comedian uh, all other hours. All right, so the format tonight is I'm going to speak to Brian for 20 minutes, then I'm going to speak to Kasha for 20 minutes, and then I'm going to speak to the two, have the two of you together, and then the audience. It, it almost sounds like speed dating or I something, know. David. What? <laughs> it's kind of, yeah. and now, Kasha is going to dismiss herself into our soundproof <laughs> waiting area. So I can't hear anything he said. Exactly. To see if our, if our answers match up. Yeah. Hear, hear. It's a newlywed game now. <laughs> yeah. Do, how well do we know each other? <laughs> you, can, you can hear it. You can, you can, you won't be able to see, but you can hear I like it. the way this is going. We could completely cut David out at this rate. Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for inviting us, David. <laughs> You're welcome. But I can close, stop the webinar anytime. So. Okay. <laughs> Wait, didn't you make her a host? <laughs> Maybe she can. She'll be, host, she'll be host later. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So. Kasha, just let's do the disappearing act and we'll see you in 20 minutes. Okay, thank you. Here we go, speed round. All right, so for the people in the audience who joined us, uh, I thank you for taking time out of your day. And if you have questions, put them in the Q&A box and we'll do those during the last 20 minutes. The chat box is for Joe, me and everyone else. Okay, and, and Kasha. Okay, so Brian, um, David, what have you been doing the last year? Yeah, I don't it's know. Funny. It's so weird. It's uh, which which I have been calling, by the way, the year of no pants, mm -hmm. um, which uh, and, you know, I live in Raleigh, North Carolina. Now, I'm not from here, but this is where I am uh, since 2012. And it's really hot. There's a long, hot summer here. So by the time the pandemic got going here, it was already pretty hot. Um, I was really lucky in that uh, I'm a video geek. You know, I do some video production and mm -hmm. um, uh, a lot of it involving interviewing scientists, but I have a background in video production. And now everybody seems to have some kind of studio in their home, but I was actually putting together a studio in my home uh, in the year leading up to the pandemic. I didn't have insider knowledge, but I was like uh, getting something like that ready before it's so, 
I have this like studio space here and I did a lot of virtual stuff. I hosted a lot of things. I performed, I was telling you before the, the program that uh, I, I believe this would apply to Kasha as well, that we're both in the stand-up comedy world, but we're also both in our own self-created sort of stand-up comedy world uh, where it intersects the world of science. Um, most of my comedian friends work at mostly comedy clubs and those gigs just canceled comedy clubs so some comedy shows started happening that but they weren't great paid gigs they were just well let's do some virtual comedy anyway i was really lucky because i don't work comedy clubs very often anymore i mostly go to either universities or science conferences and those things you know after a few bumps a lot of events that were gonna be in person just became virtual. And I was still able to get paid to do either, uh, you know, my work is kind of split. I perform my geeky stand-up comedy, science comedy, uh, but I also give science communication talks that are geared towards helping scientists speak to the public better general technical information to a general audience. And then I do some video production and things and sometimes involving interviewing scientists, whether it's live onto Facebook, like we'll talk about Lindau, um, but, uh, or shooting stuff. At the beginning of the pandemic, I got super busy um, because gigs that canceled became virtual. I The first gig I was supposed to, that I had to canceled, I was supposed to get a my old hometown of San Francisco. I was going to do some stuff for Lawrence Berkeley Lab. I was going to perform and give a science communication talk. And I was going to uh, spend a whole week in the Bay Area. There was a young physicist that I met at Lindau last the year before, David, and he's a pilot. And he was going to take me flying around the Bay Area in a, in a small plane. Um, and I was going to catch up with a lot of people. That was the first gig to cancel. That whole thing went away. But we negotiated a new deal and I did something virtual for, for Lawrence Berkeley. And that sort of set the pace for the rest of things. All the gigs canceled, but some of them got postponed and then many became virtual. And, you know, I think by now, so many of us, anyone listening to this may have had the opportunity to have to give a talk or a presentation where you're in webinar mode and you can't even see or hear an audience. And that is extra complicated when you're doing stand-up comedy because sometimes you might think stand-up comedy is a monologue um but as soon as you try to do it without an audience you see how much of a dialogue it is that i'm always relying on a certain kind of input and and a, a, the role of the audience and the laughter and the, the rhythm i achieve is in harmony with the room and you learn this that little rooms and big rooms have a different pace. Sometimes a vast venue, you have to slow down for, and, and you, you can feel it. You learn to, um, well, so you know, imagine me. doing stand-up comedy and, and especially, you know, when I have those geeky bar jokes and they're designed to do rattle them off a bunch in a row, but I like count on the kind of crest of the wave of the laugh to kind of ride it. And like, you let it fade a little and then you hit them with the next joke. So it was pretty weird in the middle of a performance to realize how weird it is that there's no all, one. All the late night comedians talked about how when they first started, they're just by themselves. And, you know, that you would pause for a laugh, but there's no laughs coming. So their timing, they had to get used to a new sense of timing. Yeah. And, you know, we're used to telling the, it's, it's, it's like, it's not an impossible thing, but it's really different from what we're used to. And like I said, to me, it like totally points out what a dialogue it is. If you think it's just a monologue, <clears throat> no, I don't want people, you know, they're, they're just, they're supposed to participate on my terms. <laughs> I don't want them just saying anything at any time, but, um, but it's definitely a dialogue um, and I'm playing off them. And in fact, there's a non -ver I've always thought that just being a comedian is such a weird thing to, to go around the country and think of it in a non kind of verbal way, take the words away. It's you, like you identify I've identified some sentences or some sounds, like let's take the words out of it for a second. I've identified some series of sounds that if I go around the country saying these, making these sounds, I get pretty much the same response for an audience. So I'll go, bah, 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 and they go, wah, 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 ha, 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 wah, 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 ha, ha. And it's, it's just a very, what a weird thing to do 
for a living. <laughs> but so now that things are opening up, um, are you going to be doing live performances? Yeah. So I did in the entire pandemic, I did one actual in-person show. I forget when it was. It was after the summer, late summer, maybe last year. And what it was is I went to Wilmington. I drove um, to the to a beach town and I did a show at a bar in a outdoor backyard patio, open air patio, um, very small crowd and spread out and masked. So I did one show and it was kind of interesting, kind of that midway point where it was like really interesting to be doing it. And, but I was a little nervous going into it. Like I almost was like, as the science comedian, it would almost be perfect if I came out like wearing a space suit, <laughs> more than just a mask, wearing a space suit. And, uh, and then uh, I guess the show would end when I run out of air. That was, that was my first concept for the show. But um, the, the uh, last gig that I did was pretty cool. The last gig I did before things canceled, I went to Lauren, uh, I went to uh, um, Lawrence the uh, <laughs> Los Alamos National Lab, sorry. So I just, uh, just bookending this, it's like, I finally have my first flight coming up. So in February of 2020, I did some stuff at Los Alamos National Lab. I spent a couple of days there and I gave some talks and I had some meetings and it was just a great, great experience and what a neat place to go. And that was the last thing I did. And my next flight is coming up in two weeks and I'm gonna go back to Germany for the Lindau Nobel Laureate meeting. And um, and that's a virtual meeting, right? It is, you know, they were hoping. So one of the things I did this year in 2020, um, it was supposed to be a really big meeting. It was the 70th annual meeting and it was gonna be super big and cross-disciplinary, but it had to be virtual. It was last summer, uh, this time last, last summer. And so that was virtual and I did a bunch of things for it. I, for some of the young attendees, I guess we should say what the meeting is. Yeah. Um, and I still wanna give a little anecdote about it later when, when we have Kasha, but um, the Lindau Nobel, it's, it's in a little town called Lindau, Germany, Southern Germany, it's on Lake Constance. It's this little quaint little touristy uh, town. And every year they bring in a large group of Nobel laureates, like a couple or few dozen. And then hundreds, like six or 800, I think it was gonna be a thousand maybe this last year, uh, young scientists from up to a hundred countries around the world. The young is under 35, there's undergrads, grad students, postdocs, doctoral students. Um, and they're there to be mentored by the Nobel laureates, not just to learn science, just to socialize and ask them questions about work-life balance. And it's really, interesting and the laureates are there for the young scientists and the young scientists are kind of there for the laureates but it's a, it's a really interesting event and um i'll tell you how i got involved when we get kasha back on here but um so last year it was virtual and for the young scientists i gave some training because they had to do some video stuff so i i gave some kind of workshop advice and then I hosted some things and moderated some panels and ran some Q&A. And that's the sort of things I've been doing. Uh, and because of the weather, this is what I started to tell you before, is that it's so hot here in, and it's gearing up again now. It's so hot here that during the day, it would get pretty hot in my house. So I'm walking around in slippers or barefoot and shorts and then maybe no shirt until from the rack over there, just off camera, I pull a dress shirt off, put it on, and then it's dress shirt, here, shorts, slippers, you know, business virtual, I've been calling that. So will you be, tra will you be traveling this year? So I'm gonna, my first trip is coming up in two weeks and I haven't booked anything else yet, but yeah, but you know what? I gotta tell you, I, I know that it'll be interesting to see what the new normal is, how much we go back to our old ways and how much we retain some of these differences mm -hmm. and how many people will continue to work virtually because it works for that industry. Um, for me, that first gig I did for Berkeley that I was getting paid for, like I was getting paid decently. And all I did was trot into here, uh, in, into my home studio, turn all the stuff on. I gave my science communication talk and then I turned all the lights off and I sent them an invoice. And it was like, I didn't have to go to the airport, check into a hotel. Um, 
so the idea of doing more and more stuff virtually is appealing, but yeah, I'm kind of a social creature. Sometimes I'm, I'm at two sides, introvert, extrovert. And this was pretty isolating because I live completely alone, not even a goldfish, very alone. And uh, so one of the things that happened is I realized that maybe we all have imagined, especially writers, writers out there have a lot of imaginary, we have active imaginations and maybe a lot of imaginary conversations. I realized that during the pandemic and during quarantine, I think I had more imaginary conversations and an increasing percentage of them were out loud perhaps. And here's what I caught myself where I felt like this was like an achievement, unlock, like a whole new level of imaginary conversation is that I have a little plant, I'm plant sitting for someone. I was plant sitting for our friend Katie Mack uh, from the science community, author of The End of Everything, Astrophysically Speaking, available from Scribner. This is not a commercial, just a joke, um, <laughs> but it is true. But Katie had, I held a plant for her while she was out of town for most of the pandemic. And it was by this window. And one day I was opening the drapes and I barely brushed the drape up by the plant. And I actually said out loud, uh, sorry, buddy, to the plant. And I'm pretty sure that's a first for me, but I apologize to a plant. Okay. That's how things are going. Here's yeah. how they started. That's how they're going. <laughs> You know, it's a hard thing to decide whether you want to be alone or stuck with someone or whatever. I can't say, I don't think very many single people, people that lived alone, it's hard to be sympathetic for all the people complaining about being locked up. I understand that it could be rough to share a small space with people, but but it's hard to be sympathetic that, that you're trapped in a house with some of the people that are most important in the world to you, most important people in the world to you when when you're completely alone. Luckily, I have great neighbors with great dogs, and we did a lot of socializing in the street, so we got through it. So, I mean, you know, I you know, I think about my daughter. She has two 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 children at home, one three and one one year. Her husband's <laughs> trying to work from home. She's teaching online from home, and that is that 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 is not much much harder than what we're, we're doing. So, yeah. Anyways, um, so, so yeah, you know, early in the pandemic, one of the things I noticed, I was looking at some old notes to try to remember, because now as things go back, so much that we were doing at the beginning of the pandemic, it's already changed. We're not wearing our masks quite as much. And um, I remember that at the beginning, I, uh, oh, just all the weird, did anyone eat weird foods? Like, I don't know why, but I was eating a lot of string cheese and peanuts and I'm making a lot of smoothies. Um, and then I realized that I was using as a rationalization, like anytime you want to eat something, you can just say, like, well, I like little, <clears throat> I have a little cough. I'm a little nervous. Maybe I better see if my sense of taste is still there. So, you know, eat something sweet. Yeah, still got it. Better try something salty, something okay. fat. Okay. Still have the sense of taste. That's good. Um, all right, so I'm gonna um, have you turn off and Kasha, could you come on? All right then, bye. <laughs> so, Kasha, you have a present little presentation, correct? <laughs> yes, uh, I, I documented uh, all the things that I did last year. Um, so, yeah, I will. Well, first, I'll just kind of start off with a little bit of um, anecdotes about some of my experiences, and I'll go into my presentation if that's all right with you. Sure. Um, yeah, so last year, you know, uh, like Brian, uh, you know, I didn't stop doing comedy. I do outside of pandemic before pandemic, I would probably go out and do comedy about four to 11 times a week. Um, you know, in addition to talking about science, like you said, in my bio, I also joke about many other things. So when I would go out and do my comedy, those would be at uh, open mics, bars, showcases, comedy clubs, all those things. But then when we um, did Zoom comedy, uh, I learned a lot of different things. Um, I actually did 150 comedy shows in 2020. Um, and the majority of those were Zoom shows. Uh, I, one of my most memorable performances was when I got Zoom bombed, 
Uh, so I actually um, was in the middle of talking and then someone came on and this was in May. So it was like after like they already did the security things and people knew about Zoom bombing. But I was in the middle of talking and some like TikToker, some kid came on and decided to interrupt and say some uh, things. So we muted everybody. And then um, then this person decided to screen share and they put up porn. Uh, so we kicked everybody out of the meeting and then we brought people back. And the worst part that I learned was that some people didn't know what a Zoom bomb was. Uh, and they just thought that was part of my act. Like, this is me. Like, this is just like I'm some kind of freak who does that. So that was kind of a funny, uh, I mean, you know, that became a funny joke for that. At the end of 2020, you know, I kind of wrote down a couple of speculations about 2020, like 2020, similar to what Brian was saying, 2020 was the year that it made more sense to buy an RV than a pair of pants. Uh, 2020 was the year that I canceled my Netflix subscription, not because of anything controversial, but because I ran out of things to watch. 2020 was the year that I realized that lack of time is not the reason that I'm a bad cook. Uh, 2020 was the number of TV shows that I watched last year. So, you know, just trying to capitalize and figure out what everyone was doing and just to make bits around those. Uh, I will go ahead and share my screen now to tell you a little bit about what I did. Um, so like Brian, you know, he talked about some gigs that <laughs> went away because of pandemic. Um, actually, uh, so we shut down around March 15th and officially. Um, and then on March 15th was actually, I was supposed to be traveling to Saudi Arabia for a gig. Um, it was actually for a Pi Day gig, uh, well, so Pi Day weekend. Um, so that didn't happen, obviously. There was another um, gig where I'm actually was supposed to be in a museum, uh, but that, uh, and I was supposed to do a big presentation for that. It's called Planet Word and it's in Washington, DC. I helped uh, organize, or I helped write the comedy section of it and they um, asked if they could use one of my stand-up clips in there. So uh, that obviously got posted postponed until October. And this is a picture of me when I got to do it, uh, you know, very, very limited. So that was kind of a neat thing. But you know, we didn't have the big blowout opening that we wanted to have. Um, then I started doing virtual shows because I was like, okay, we don't know how long this is going to last. I had a big Earth Day show that I was planning on doing last year because it was a 50th anniversary. I had a big thing planned at the DC Improv. Um, but it got canceled, obviously. So I was like, well, maybe I'll try doing it virtually. And, you know, it worked out fine enough. So then I started doing my science comedy shows virtually. Like David mentioned, I run DC Science Comedy. So we got picked up in the Washington Post. Um, and I did an Asian um, a show uh, celebrating Asians for last May. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, I've had some good times doing the virtual shows. Um, one thing that I would say, uh, one advantage about the virtual shows, you know, Brian talked about the fact you don't have to go anywhere. The other advantage is uh, following along that is there's no geographic barriers. So I would have shows that had people literally on one show, Australia, the UK and Ireland. I mean, it was incredible the amount of talent that I could get on one show because, you know, all you had to do was log on. So in a way, it made it kind of easier to produce the shows because I could pick a theme and then bring people on those. And I had a lot of fun with the shows. I did one with robots. It was a robot themed show. So I actually had a robot on screen. I had another person who had this really cool AI technology and they did improv via Zoom. So um, we also did characters where I would get into a character. I'll show a picture of that. So I would say that, you know, you can't necessarily do a Zoom comedy show, just like stand up there and do um, stand up. I mean, you could, but you know, you really, there's a lot more ways you could take advantage of the platform. Now, at the beginning of pandemic, I definitely wanted to learn, um, you know, I'm very much into the research side of comedy. Uh, so, oh yeah, so this is my best of 2020. Uh, um, I said I did 150 shows. I actually took a best of 2020 compilation on my YouTube channel, which anyone can watch. Just um, you can, I'll put a link in the chat after this. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of a fun thing if you just want to hear all the things that happened to me in 2020, including like when I got engaged and then like the Zoom weddings that I attended and all kinds of um, silly things along with new science jokes. 
Um, now, one thing that I did at the very beginning was I actually talked to a researcher. I started a podcast called Science Comedy Paradox, um, and I actually had material for this podcast before 2020. I've been building up for it for a bit, um, talking to headliners um, that would do my science comedy shows. And then pandemic hit, and it just felt kind of off. It, it didn't feel like it was the right tone to talk about, like, how do you write a joke when we're in the middle of a pandemic? So um, I actually talked to a researcher about virtual comedy, and I'm hoping that I shared the sound with this. I think how I How much does laughter matter in a live comedy performance? Uh, a huge amount. There's a lot of research showing that if you have audience laughter accompanying your comedy, then people laugh more, and they also find it funnier as well. And they also find the comedy more enjoyable. And it applies to canned laughter and to sort of spontaneous natural laughter. What is it about laughter, even if it's recorded, that makes comedy funnier? The laughter acts as some sort of attentional marker. So the laughter draws your attention to something somebody has said. It's kind of like a virtual exclamation point. So if I were to do a virtual comedy show, would you recommend that I insert a laugh track? It would work if you do it subtly. If you do have three people, though, watching, I wouldn't do that because it would just insert a laugh track onto your own comedy. <laughs> the three may become two, may become one. If you had like a big-ish audience, though, and you had sort of like mild ambient audience noise, that might work. So there's been a lot of research. Um, I think it's kind of well known now that laughter, even if it's a laugh track, does help comedy. So when you have virtual comedy where you can't really <laughs> hear laughter that well, um, you know, it's not exactly fantastic. Um, How much does laughter I matter? That again. Okay, so these are some of the virtual comedy shows that I did. I try to make it dynamic. Here's where I dressed up as a potato. I had a filter for that. Um, you know, for a holiday show, I put on antlers. You can see my background over here that I currently have. For Ocean, World Ocean Day, I put an ocean in the back. For an Indian fundraiser, I wore an Indian dress. Um, so, yeah, you know, oh, I had my dog on one of them where I just kind of did a voiceover on my dog. Um, uh, I did experiments. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I try to have fun with it. Um, during pandemic, uh, one way that I tried to have fun with it was we, me and two other comics in New York started something called um, Extra Ridiculous Science, which you can see at sciencecomedytrivia.com. And that was a way to make it more interactive. We actually used something. So this is me hosting it. And this is we had Clippy. Uh, one of us acted as Clippy from like Microsoft Word. So that was just kind of a fun thing we did. And that was a lot of fun. You know, we had comedians competing with the audience. The audience would pull out their phone. We used a program called Kahoot. Um, and they would actually play uh, and compete. So it was like educational as well as fun. And then, you know, the winner got prizes that we would send them. Um, oh, another thing that I did about writing, um, writing jokes was hard because um, you're kind of isolated, but more so than that, it's testing the jokes. You know, Brian talked about you go out to the clubs or, you know, wherever and you test the jokes and open mics weren't a thing. So I kind of had to come up with different ways to write jokes. So what I did is I actually wrote a joke of the day every day on my Instagram for a bit. And I had my followers vote on them. So I highly recommend if you want to hear, if you want to vote on jokes, you know, whether you like them or not, the feedback is really helpful for me. Um, so these are some of the jokes that I did. Um, during COVID, it may appear that I'm underperforming because all I do is eat and sleep, but that's what 90% of the animal kingdom does regularly. I'm performing at an average level for a grizzly bear. Um, humans are the smartest animals in the world, according to a survey conducted by humans. That was actually two parts to that joke. And then another thing that I did was I actually had the audience pick which ending they liked better. Um, climate change is a lot like TikTok, only the younger generation knows what to do with it, or by the time we found out it was bad, it was too late. I think more people like that last one, the uh, option B, and some people even just like message me with their own ideas. And all of these I have taken in person. I've done them on Zoom and in person to see how they worked, and I'll talk a little bit about that at the end if we have time. The other thing, like Brian, he talked about how he got really, um, how he was already into the video zone. I also uh, did more YouTube stuff. You know, I have a whole green room studio, a green screen studio in my next place. We got all this nice equipment where I could do my podcasting and the video stuff. I actually did a fact checking Space Force um, series, which was really cool, where I'd watch the Netflix show with a um, 
expert. And then we'd go through and just kind of fact check it and say like, you know, funny things about it that like that would never happen and like actually real facts about it. So that was fun. Um, and I actually still have some more episodes I need to do because it took much longer to process than I thought. Um, yeah, these are some of my other videos that I did. Um, do penguins have a sense of humor? Right before pandemic, I went to Antarctica, so I had some time to process some of those videos. I did baking soda experiments. Um, that you know, it was me tasting some baking soda, which I would not recommend. And then I actually got um, commissioned to do a. Um, history video. So I actually did science of history, a science history video about um, World War II, Battle of El Alamein, uh, talking about the hygiene that allowed the British to win. Now, um, David, how am I doing on time? Do I have time to go through this or this uh, next part? Yeah, yes, you do. You have time. Oh, okay, great. Um, so now when David asked me to do this for uh, science writers in New York, I figured, oh, okay, it might be nice if you want to hear about what I did during uh, comedy for during COVID. But I also thought maybe you want to learn about how we use comedy to communicate COVID or to address topics about COVID. And while I was doing my shows, you know, there were kind of two crowds or there was a crowd who was like into COVID comedy. And then there was another crowd that was like, oh, I want to get away from talking about the pandemic. So they didn't necessarily want to hear it. So I kind of strayed, you know, in my regular comedy acts, I didn't really talk about COVID. But like I said, if it was a specific um, platform, I would take the time to talk about COVID. So uh, I mentioned that I started my podcast, Science Comedy Paradox. And a lot of that had to do with like coronavirus comedy. I have a whole episode talking about, you know, this is like, back in March talking about, oh, how are people making this so funny? Because at that time, there wasn't a lot of time passing, you know, there's the uh, the generic formula for comedy is, you know, uh, it's uh, when a long time passes, right? Um, you can make the jokes about it, but there wasn't a lot of time. So that was interesting. We're actually um, highlighted clips of other people doing funny coronavirus comedy and, you know, strategies for doing that. Um, then I did the quarantine comedy, which was the clip that I played earlier of the virtual comedy, but I talked to a comedy club that's actually trying to go virtual. This is before virtual comedy was a big thing, and it's talking about the struggles with them and what actually works with virtual comedy. And we talk about like a couple of studies. Um, there was another really interesting one, um, my fifth episode, where I talked to Professor John Cook, who perhaps some of you know him, but he's really big into climate change um, misinformation, um, debunking that through cartoons and humor. And I actually had him on for my Earth Day show last year, and he talked about how the misinformation and climate change is very similar to the misinformation with COVID. And he is applying similar techniques that he uses for climate change debunking into COVID, um, uh, uh, COVID debunking. And, you know, he comes from a more psychology background. And he said that, you know, one thing that they do is called um, parallel, um, it's like parallel analogies. And it's this idea that, you know, you have the logic of one situation and then you take that logic and apply it to another situation that is ridiculous. And the more ridiculous that second situation is, the more you can see that that logic doesn't hold up. Um, and in, in comedy, we do this all the time. You know, you see it on Colbert um, when he is, uh, I mean, all the late night hosts do this really well, where it's uh, where they take the logic of one situation, and apply it to another one. I mean, one of my own jokes that I do this with is, um, David did mention that I work at NASA and, you know, a lot of people, uh, I understand why NASA is so cool, right? Because we do all these things in space, but because it happens in space, you can't see it. So a lot of people think it didn't actually happen. Like a lot of people think the moon landing was fake, which is ridiculous because astronauts brought back moon rocks and there's video, you know, like I've never seen my parents mate before, but I know what happened because I'm here and there's video. So, you know, that's kind of the difference in the logic there with that kind of tag at the end, just to make it silly and funny. But this is one of the cartoons that John Cook was working on, where it's the flat, the curve is flattening, we can stop social distancing. Okay, well, if you use that logic, let's, uh, <laughs> let's apply this to a different situation. The parachute has slowed my fall, I can take it off now. So, you know, hopefully trying to show the difference. Um, in the logic there and how it doesn't necessarily hold up. Um, in my podcast episode, uh, in my other episodes of my podcast, uh, I found some really interesting things. I mean, I talked about my latest episode, can memes treat depression and anxiety? 
And this um, actually just came out late last year where they're actually showing that internet memes that are related to COVID-19 uh, did did serve as a coping mechanism for anxiety <laughs> to read the title of that. Uh, but yeah, you can listen to it on the podcast and can read it a little more here, but people, um, they found them funnier if they were expressed, um, if they were more anxious during COVID, they found the COVID memes funnier and they also found it more relatable and they were more likely to share them. So they enjoyed them more. Um, in my own personal, uh, I told you I did the sciencecomedytrivia.com. We had a specific rounds all about pandemic, which was a lot of fun. You know, we talked about a study. Um, and here you can see in this upper corner of this little cell phone, that was one of my colleagues who um, uh, was playing the character of a cell phone. And she was a very tired Siri because she was like, you guys are always on their phone, whether it's TikTok or whatever, you don't let me fully charge. So it was just kind of a fun way to bring a different perspective to the situation. But yeah, we played, um, we did, a, we covered some studies about how it's affecting our brain for brain awareness week. Um, and then I think this will be second to last slide here. Um, and then right before pandemic, you know, there was a club in New York City where we uh, there was a stand-up comedian who so, tried yeah, I, I talking have a about in virology COVID. as my background uh, it's a, that's, that's it's a little more informative he's a virologist um, and comedian so i think let's start off with i feel like there's a lot of confusion around this disease and everyone uh you know i think throws around all these different names and terminology and i don't think we really understand like what it is because uh we throw around these different names like coronavirus COVID 19 I don't think people understand what they mean. Um, for instance, the analogy is my name is Raj Sivaraman, and we're throwing around all these different names. I think a good analogy would be to compare the name that we're giving coronavirus to how you would describe me. For instance, coronavirus is actually a family of viruses. So the equivalent of that would be calling me Indian. <laughs> I have a name, and you're saying Indian. That's rude. COVID-19 is actually the disease that this specific type of coronavirus causes. That's not the name of the virus. That'd be like AIDS virus. It doesn't really make any sense. The equivalent of that would be calling me science comedy. That's what I do. It's not who I am. All right. Does that make sense? That's a little less confusing. Um, another name is 2019 novel coronavirus. 2019 NCOV. Uh, the equivalent of that would be calling me new Sivaraman 1981. <laughs> aging myself in the comedy world. Um, so you kind of get the idea of what he's doing there. Um, but you know, that was at the beginning so, when yeah, people, I have, I have a PhD in when people didn't really know what was going on um, with all the different names, you know, people were saying co coronavirus, COVID-19. So it, it was just kind of a interesting way for a virologist to kind of bring that. And then, you know, there's also the famous TikTok, the guy talking about forks for the interest of time, I'm not going to show it. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, and then uh, my last slide is returning to normal. Um, yeah, I mean, I've done quite a few. I mean, I'm, I've been doing more in person shows. Um, you know, some of them require everyone to be vaccinated. I still wear my mask. I still um, have a little um, cover over here. I can stop sharing. Um, I still have a little cover that I put over my microphone. Um, there's a lot of hand sanitizing that goes on. You know, one thing I didn't realize is a lot of times when I'm holding the microphone, I'm, my mouth is literally touching the microphone. I didn't realize how disgusting that is, even not during coronavirus times. So, you know, after, you know, coronavirus goes down, I might, I, I will probably still be the weirdo who has like a little plastic thing to put over the microphone every time I go on stage because it's just disgusting to me. Um, and now when I say returning to the normal, I have been trying out some of the jokes that I did for Zoom in real life. Some of them work, some of them don't. Uh, when they don't, it's like, okay, I guess that was, but you know, I don't think of it as a waste because they worked well on Zoom. The pacing was different. Um, you have to tell a Zoom joke differently from an in-person joke. Um, and I learned that, uh, that you just have to be like more vivacious, you know, on Zoom. You have to like, you know, usually when I'm standing up and everything, so. Um, all right, so I, I want to leave time for questions. So yeah, well, happy why today. We, why don't we bring Brian back? And we'll yep. ask questions both of you. Brian? Back. Back. Um, yeah, you know, there were a couple things though that, that, that Kasha mentioned, like especially the two things about analogies and about conspiracy theories that kind of go together too. There's just been so frustrating about conspiracy theories. You even mentioned like 
uh, moon landing deniers at this point, And, you know, as, as more of the, as more of the conspiracies, we already have, you know, moon landing deniers and so much of flat earthers and all the COVID stuff came in at a certain point, you realize there are so many big conspiracies that we each have to be involved in at least one or two of them. I don't know which ones you're involved in perpetrating, but there are just too many, just anything to do with the flat earth and the space program involves not only NASA, but the space agencies and companies all around the world, every telecommunications guy. It's just ridiculous. And then when it, when it started to be talking about a conspiracy of doctors lying about the diagnosis of what somebody dies of, uh, that's, that, it's just like, what do you do with that? It's like, you think there's a worldwide conspiracy of doctors? He's like, you know, I think doctors are mostly okay. I'm sure some of them are assholes, but some of you are assholes. I'm an asshole. So what? But, but for the most part, I just can't imagine a worldwide, and same with the worldwide conspiracies that were directed at Trump not getting elected, like other countries cared. So I have had a few questions. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your science backgrounds, Kasha? Sure. Um, <laughs> I like Regina's the comments. She's taking a shot whenever Brian says uh, string cheese and she enjoys <laughs> not catching cold. Um, yeah, I, so I have two things. I have one thing to say to respond to what Brian said, but I'll answer your question first, David. Um, yeah, my background is I have a degree in chemistry. Um, I did some research there for undergrad and then I got my master's degree in science journalism. Uh, and I've been at NASA for about eight years now, and um, I have been continuing some of my science comedy. Um, I've been doing additional research recently and hopefully to have some papers published on that front. Um, should I go ahead and respond to Brian now or let Brian introduce himself? No, let's let Brian ask okay. him. So yeah, I, uh, I liked science first, way before I thought of stand-up comedy. I liked science first. I thought about becoming a scientist, but apparently that's not enough just thinking about it. You, there's a lot more to do. So I didn't pursue it. I got a liberal arts degree at the University of Texas in Austin. I went to graduate school in TV production. I was pre-med and got the liberal arts degree, but I didn't want to go to medical school. I did TV production and then I found stand-up comedy and I became a stand-up comic uh, for a long time. And it was always geeky, but it took a long time for me to come up with the phrase science comedian and cut the and go, oh, I should cut the other stuff away and focus on that. Because I started out, I was a comedian. I, it was very geeky, but I also just talked about sex and drugs and rock and roll, like any comedian, just a little bit more geeky stuff. So what's the link between with the two of you and Linda? Because I, I, I've been Linda. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Kasha got a session accepted at AAAS in 2000. 16, uh, about communicating science with humor. So it was Kasha, it was me and you and Chris Duffy. And there was an academic. Mm -hmm. Amy Becker. Yep. And I, uh, so from my experience, it was really fun. We, we had a panel, but we also had, each of us had a few minutes at the podium and I demonstrated, I did some humor. Some of my jokes are just jokes, but some communicate science. Some of them, I don't feel communicate much. They're just silly. And they, they play off the fact that you are a geek and you'll get my jokes. Um, but some are at, some communicate science. And so I had a great little set there and Countess Bettina Bernadotte, um, whose father was one of the founders of the Lindau meeting, uh, approached me and I had heard of it because of uh, being a member of the National Association of Science Writers. I'd heard of this amazing meeting and I wanted to go. So the first year I went and I performed at the opening ceremony. Um, the president of Austria was in the room. Um, uh, Vince Cerf was there and I recognized George Smoot because he had been on the Big Bang Theory and Stephen Chu was there, physics Nobel Prize winner. And then he was president of, he was secretary of energy under Obama. So um, I don't, so uh, I don't have an actual science background, but I've continued. It's the subject I would much rather read science news than politics uh, any day. So I'm old and I've, I know a lot of science, but not a scientist. Well, I know Princess Bettina also, but at one of the meetings I met the, the Princess of Jordan who invited me to their science festival. Really? Jordan. Yeah. Um, did you go? Um, I could not, uh, they didn't, they, I couldn't get a grant, so I couldn't go. 
Um, someone wants to know, um, do they allow female comedians in Saudi Arabia? They invited me and I'm female, so. <laughs> Did they know? <laughs> Sorry? Hey, you know. Who, who, who invited you? Um, uh, it was one of the universities uh, there, I think. Um, yeah, I had it all planned a year ago and I knew where I was going and stuff. But yeah, it was yeah. one of the King Abdullah art centers or something like that. Yeah, they were having like a big, um, apparently I have like family friends there. So uh, they have this big art center that they've been every week, you know, they do different events. And I thought it was really cool that they were bringing a science comedian over there. And I was actually opening, I mean, it's a funny story. I was opening for a big physicist and I was uh, the guy who I had to talk to beforehand, you know, to talk about the gig and everything. He's like, all right, so Saudi Arabia, Saudis don't have a sense of they don't you, they don't have a great sense of humor um, <laughs> off the offhand. So you're going to have to tell them that you are a comedian and you're telling jokes so they know uh. to laugh. So and I no one was introducing me. He was like, OK, so you'll be going on stage and do like 10 minutes of jokes, but tell them you're a comedian and then introduce the physicist. <laughs> and um, it was funny because I got some intel about things that I could joke about. And he's like, well, we love to complain about how hot it is here. I was like, OK, I can do that. And then there was like funny things about um, Indians. And I was like, oh, what's your impression of Indians? Because obviously I, I'm Indian. I look Indian. And uh, he, he started laughing. He goes, they always want their milk tea. They always want their milk tea. And I thought that was funny. And then he said, also, their accents are very difficult to understand. And that just kind of made me laugh so hard because <laughs> like, they're talking about, yeah, you have to have, you have to take the course twice. One, so you can learn how to understand the instructor and two, so you can actually learn the material. So um, yeah, you know, I'm bummed that I, it would definitely would have been a, a unique experience. Definitely. And it's also very hot there. Um, yes. So here's a question. Brian and Kasha, how does a science comedian deal with a science joke that bombs during a performance? And can you give an example or two for laughs? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it's that's not any different than any comedian having to deal with a joke that 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 bombs. And it's not it's not a fun experience, you know, because you're you're up there, you're so proud and you deliver this gem. And then there's that space that you've left open for their raucous laughter and there's nothing so yeah it's pretty harsh it's a judgment but you know there's a funny thing going on that after a while it's like yeah the audience is judging you moment by moment but you're judging the audience too <laughs> and they may not know it but i'm judging them because sometimes it's like oh that joke that got a better than average I, that, that that joke maybe I'm a little bit of a champion for that joke that's kind of subtle, but that time it got a pretty good laugh. Or, you know, I'm judging them the things they laugh at and don't laugh at. And sometimes I used to have these two back-to-back -back puns and sometimes the first one wouldn't get a laugh and then the second one would. And I always felt this self-righteous thing of like, oh, you didn't like that one? Well, watch this. I'll get you to laugh at the next pun anyway. <laughs> but yeah, I don't I have a good example of a bombing joke offhand. I mean, I it happens. <laughs> Why would we want to re? Why would you ask us to recreate a moment of, of failure <laughs> for you? I mean, I'd say if we have a joke that bombed consistently, we took it out of our set. Um, yeah. Every joke that you have, you know, it doesn't do well a hundred percent of the time. Yeah. The way that I approach jokes that bomb is, it's all data, right? So, I mean, in my TEDx talk, I I analyzed five hundred of my jokes to figure out which ones were really good and which ones perform not as well. So for me, it's all data that I want to collect to improve my set. So um so for a joke that bombs, you know, I go out, I don't have science comedy audiences all the time during non pandemic times during pandemic times, an interesting thing happened. Um, people came to me and because they knew I was like science background, I got a lot of more science gigs and I could do my science jokes and those worked really well. As I'm going back out to regular places, I'm trying to do those science jokes and you know, people aren't like as enthusiastic about it. But that's actually good news for me because, you know, for my kind of what Brian was talking about earlier about, you know, how do you address this conspiracy theory kind of thing? Um, you know, I don't really necessarily want to preach to the choir. I don't want to necessarily only talk to people who love science. Uh, so for me, it's really important that if a science joke doesn't do well in front of a normal audience, unscient like not a huge sciencey audience, um, I go back home and I take it and see how I can fix it so that way I can get them to laugh. Because, 
you know, I love making science people laugh and I think it's a great demographic and I will always cherish that demographic, but um, I also want to make it a little more mainstream. Um, Someone want to know who are your, um, your heroes in comedy? Who, who do you, um, who's creating Comedic influences? Influences, yeah. Why are you rewriting the question? We can see it there, David. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm, not to, I'm not supposed to ask it. <laughs> You're trying to pass it off as your own question. No, you know what? No. I, when I was growing up, I was listening to a lot of George Carlin, Richard Pryor, Steve Martin, Monty Python. I had Monty Python albums, vinyl. I'm, I'm an old. And um, the first SNL uh, crew had an album. So that was, that was, and I used to like to watch... Uh, uh, Monty Python and yeah, and the original SNL. So uh, George Carlin was a big one for me. And then you know what? I in the science in reading science and science fiction, Isaac Asimov wrote both. He was a great explainer of science, maybe the best explainer of science. He was very rational and he could take you to a complex place without losing you. And it was just so clear and linear, and he never lost you. And I feel like Asimov maybe had the most, I'd like to think, of shaping my sensibilities. I read a lot of Asimov, science fiction and science fact. And there's something about his rational way and his clear explaining that I think had a big influence on me as much as the, com as much as the comedians. Asha? Um, yeah, I, uh, I think Brian did a great job talking about science sciencey people that are great influences in terms of comedy people um i mean i'd say that there's every comedian that i watch like on netflix or hbo or whatever i can always learn something from them um like ali wong i really like her because i think she does a really great job with act outs and that's something that i would like to do as well as her um for john mulaney i really like that he I, I like his storytelling aspect, the fact that he can enthrall you in the story, but insert jokes in between. Um, He's great. Yeah. So, I mean, there's those who I'd say are two solid people. I mean, Ali Wong's also a little dirtier. So if you don't like dirty comedy, then maybe don't watch her. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think those are two pretty good ones. I mean, people don't like Amy Schumer, but, you know, I think Amy Sch Schumer has this personality on stage uh, that, you know, also, when you look at like how fast they can do the jokes up there um, from one punchline to the next, I think that's yeah. also impressive. I really like Brian. I mentioned comics really that I grew up listening to as far as those influences. But later when I got into comedy, all sorts of other people, Bill Hicks, I was a Texas comic and Bill Hicks is someone that unfortunately died at 33 years old of pancreatic cancer. Um, but having done about a dozen Letterman's and a couple HBO specials, he's pretty brilliant. And Brian Regan, and he's provocative, like like you were saying, like some dirty company. But Brian Regan, squeaky clean and brilliantly funny. Another one. Uh, but a lot of comics. And then so many comics we see that they're just not famous. But but in the comedy world, we know them and love them and they become influential. Tom Lair. I totally grew up. I, I had an evening wasted with Tom Lair and I love, still love that album. And um, it was science comedy. I, How about I like, that? I like Tom Lair too. He was a mathematician, I believe. Yeah. Uh, um, but he told one, he was doing one song and he stopped in the middle and said, it's a very comforting thought for me to know that when Mozart was my age, he'd been dead 20 years. <laughs> you know, I remember that. Um, do you believe that anti-vaxxers are a fair game for stand-up comedy jokes? Or are you concerned you might insult too many members of your audience? Yeah, I think they're pretty, I think that it's a, an important enough subject that they're totally fair game. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'd say that, yeah, I, I could see them as being fair game too, but I guess I would wonder what is the point of that joke if you're just picking on anti-vaxxers like I mean yeah there might be an anti-vaxxer in the club but if you're picking on them they're obviously not going to not be an anti-vaxxer obviously yeah. I don't know well it depends what you mean by picking on like that's yeah. the thing about jokes like jokes can be can just be you know like during 9-11 there was this whole feeling like is it okay to joke about a subject like this like 9-11 well if you're gonna tell racist jokes about terrorists or people from the middle east well that's 
inappropriate. But after 9-11, I was writing about the media coverage and I was writing about my own experience of having to fly as soon as they resumed flights after 9-11. So it's like you can find topics and discuss things. So you can discuss vaccine denialism. It's not it doesn't have to just be an attack on them if you if you have a clever joke. Yeah, Ideally. like yeah. a joke that I've heard pretty f often about an anti-vaxxer joke is, you know, someone came up to me and they're like, I can't believe like you're taking a vaccine. Do you even know what's in that? And the person's like, I eat McDonald's like McNuggets all the time. Like, yeah. I definitely don't know what's in that. So exactly. that's kind of a fun way to bring it yeah. back on yourself and make it so you're addressing the anti-vaccine. Yeah. And you know topic. what? Like you were saying, that's another kind of analogy. And similarly, my sister went out on a date with someone who turned out to be an anti-vaxxer and, and he's going off on, you know, he heard about one guy that got the vaccine and then died and he's making a big, so I'm scared of the vaccine. Well, guess what? I've heard of 3 million people who died from COVID. So you, you maybe heard about one. <laughs> How come you're not more scared of COVID? It's just like, it's so weird when you put, you know what? But sometimes just like when a comedian bombs and blames the audience, it's almost always not the audience's fault. It's the comedian's fault. It's a failure to communicate. And a lot of times when I think if the scientific community isn't reaching people, we shouldn't blame them like we sometimes do for being dumb or something. And one reaction I saw really early on was this idea that, oh yeah, like some people that just, I guess they don't even want to believe the virus exists. And they're saying things like, I saw this on Facebook. Oh yeah, yeah, it's this horrible, evil, terrible, deadly virus, but soap can destroy it, right? So like, let that sink in for a second because you can kind of see like, they feel like it's this dangerous, horrible, impenetrable thing. How can soap bring it down? But there's, it's such a simple answer and it's just chemistry. And I thought of an analogy, which is like, it would be as if like, if my house was on fire and my house is on fire and the fire department comes and they start bringing hoses and spraying water on it. And I go, you're going to just put water. My house is on fire and you brought water. Like, how is that going to help? It's, it's, it's kind of that absurd. Um, but I don't know if you can, it's sometimes people are so steeped in their worldview that I don't know if we can reach them. But I don't think we should think they're stupid. You do have the same thing with chemophobia in general. We have to understand where they're getting these ideas. Sometimes it's not because they're ignorant. It's because they are watching the news and they are hearing things. Well, at, 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 at Lindau, one of the scientists talked about science denialism, which I wrote up. Um, and he said he that, you know, for, for, for Scientific American, and he was saying that, yes, there are people who don't believe in vaccines, but they do believe in, they, they want their airplanes inspected by engineers and built by engineers. They want their elevators inspected. They want their food, food inspected. Yes. And stuff like that. So a science denier, denier can be very selective. Yeah, David, well, just a couple hours ago, I was thinking about how, you know how sometimes people complain nowadays about the gatekeepers or something? And it's like, but yeah. like you just said, it's like, um, we want gatekeepers in a lot of situations. But there's also, <laughs> you know, there's also, there's science denialism on the left and the right. I mean, yeah. the vaccine deniers in California yeah. were left-wing, you, know, you know, Berkeley people who believe their children would get, um, autism from vaccines and they didn't vaccinate their children. There was big measles outbreaks. And these were not Trumpers. These were left-wing people who said they, you know, they didn't believe in the, you know, or I've had people say to me, no one's had so many vaccines in such a short amount of time. And it's like, I say, well, thank goodness <laughs> we have more vaccines. So anyways, we're, we're close to our um, time ending. Um, before you go, I just want to mention what's coming up in the next few weeks. Yeah. So on June 14th, I'm going to be speaking to Dr. Stephanie Strani. Um, she is an Associate Dean of Global Health Sciences, and she's the author of the book, The Perfect Predator, where she talked about how she saved her husband's life from a deadly superbug. So wife of the year, right? Saved her husband's life through science. On June 24th, I'll be talking to Dr. Lisa Damour, who is a psychologist and the author of several New York Times bestselling books. One is Untangled, Guiding Teenage Girls Through the Seven Transitions into Adulthood and Under Pressure, Confronting the Epidemic of Stress and Anxiety in Girls. 
On March 28th, I'm sorry, June 28th, I'll be speaking to Marshall Allen, a ProPublica, on his new book, Never Pay the First Bill and Other Ways to Fight the Healthcare System. On July 8th, I'll be speaking to Catherine Eben, who's a Vanity Fair contributing editor and author of Bottle of Lies, and she will talk about her article on the origins of the COVID-19 pandemic. So I want to take, thank um, Brian and Kasha for doing it. This is a nice break for me from doing hard reporting on COVID. And this was a big break from you from doing important episodes. No, not really. <laughs> it's, it's, really it's nice to do all kinds of things. Uh, I'm but, kidding. And this is a lot of fun. And thank you so much. And stay safe. And I hope to see you in prison. I saw you perform with Caveat. Caveat is, is this Friday. I just, um, they just told me Ben just told me they're having live performances again. And yeah, hopefully I'll see you up there. Hopefully yeah. this fall I can go up there. John Mulraney is performing live at the City Winery, but you mm -hmm. have to show that you're fully vaccinated. Cool. Mm -hmm. Thanks so, for uh, thanks for uh, the invitation. Oh, well, yeah. Thank you for seeing you, and hopefully I'll see you at Lindau next year, and I will see you at a Triple A S meeting next year in Lindau. Yes. <laughs> Take care, everybody, and stay safe, and tune in next week. Okay. <laughs> Good night. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> nice seeing you, Brian. Nice seeing you, Dave. Good to see you. <laughs>